Thank you, Dave. Paul R.C. was under the weather this morning, so that was David Barnes, in case you are new here and didn't know. Please continue with me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we come this morning asking that you comfort us. I know there are so many here in need of comfort, in need of a reminder of your love. Please be with those in that need and help us to be evidence of your love. God, for those who are in a position to be your hands and feet this morning, we ask that you challenge us, that you make us uncomfortable, that you give us the courage to live and to follow your Son into the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, a few days ago, uh, I ventured out uh, to get my family a healthy snack. Uh, our boys had some friends over, and so I took the orders for uh, the healthy snack, uh, a couple of jelly donuts, um, a couple of Boston creams. Uh, I had my heart set on an apple fritter. And uh, these were not to be just any donuts, but Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, you see, the first Dunkin' location after a many-year hiatus had opened in the East Bay. And uh, as I've heard from many of my East Coast friends, Duncan is an institution there. It, it isn't that the donuts are exceptional. I, I personally strongly prefer Bob's here in the city uh, or even the Fillmore Bake Shop right down the street here. Many donuts that are better than Duncan. But there's something about the smell and something about uh, everything about it that just makes many of our East Coast friends feel like home. It is a comfort food for them. And so I went over on the first day, I did not go for this, but the first day there was a line at 2 a.m. for a 5 a.m. opening around the block, people who had to get their Dunkin'. I thought after waiting a few days, there would not be any problem. So I, I made my approach, and as I came up to, uh, up to the building, I could smell the, the fat, I could, could smell the sugar and the butter and all of the, the deliciousness. Um, I was preparing to get a box of treats for which I would need to buy larger pants after consuming, but I was willing to do this. I approached Duncan. I could see the pink boxes. I could see the donuts on the shelves. And then a manager came out and said, I'm sorry, but a little while ago, a man came up to buy a jelly donut. And we were out of jelly donuts. And he went nuts, and he became so aggressive that we had to call the police, and they had to close the store for further investigation. This is a true story. I was standing there. <laughs> I've heard of road rage, but this was my first exposure to jelly donut rage. This is a real problem we need to become aware of and, and prepare support groups for. And while I'm sure that this particular man, perhaps he was from Boston or, or this was something he had a heart set on for a long time, had bigger problems in life than just getting a jelly donut, and this was a trigger. Uh, his response was all too common for what has become our American mentality. Even if we don't go completely bonkers like this man did, we expect to get what we want when we want it with very few exceptions. As I speak, Google engineers and others are preparing drones to drop a box of jelly donuts for this man at some point so he doesn't have to go through what he did. There are people preparing to give us what we want on demand at any moment, and we often feel entitled to this. Now, before you or I judge uh, Mr. Jelly Donut, think of the things I'm sure every single one of us at least once has behaved like a child when we didn't get something we thought that we wanted. I have witnessed kale salad rage at one point. At, uh, at, at the cafe at a, a gym I used to go to, they run out of kale salad, and there was an incident involving the absence of kale salad. Some of you are worried a lot about whether your favorite kombucha is available after the service, and the things that we worry about can become the core of our being. See, there are people here today who are very legitimately worrying about where they will live. I meet people every week here at Calvary who wonder where their next meal will come from. These are real concerns and in no way mean to dismiss them. We are here for you if you're going through one of those times of challenge. For many, uh, worrying about 
bus seats and where we're going to get into our restaurant and uh, whether we have uh, enough in our retirement accounts become our primary thinking point throughout the day. We can get to the point where we are exhausted by our worry, and our exhaustion comes from this scarcity mentality. See, we live in the land of plenty, but we so often struggle to feel it. We so often to struggle to feel that abundance. Even if we have very little here, in San Francisco, we can all get a drink of clean water somewhere. We can likely find a meal somewhere. We have access to some resource that many in the world do not, and we struggle to feel that abundance around us. Almost every time I have taken uh, a group from the U.S. on a mission service trip to another country, several people say something along the lines of, they have so little, but they seem so happy. How, how can they be so happy when they don't have what we have? Today, Jesus has a little something to say about that and has a, a little something to say as he was preparing to send disciples out. He, in our passage that you heard David read, he was sending out uh, 70 new disciples out into the world. But I'd like to, to take a step back from that. And if you uh, would like to follow along, open your pew Bibles to page 842. Or if you have a phone or a device, you can just Google uh, NRSV Luke 9. And we'll be reading the first six verses of Luke 9 together. I'll give you a moment to catch up. In this passage, uh, as it will say in the header in the Bible, this is the mission of the 12, the 12 uh, original disciples of Jesus uh, ready to be sent out. And I want you to pay close attention to the packing list he gives the disciples. Let us read together if you wish. Then Jesus called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. He said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bread, nor, nor bread, nor money, not even an extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there and leave from there. Wherever they do not welcome you, as you were leaving that town, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They departed and went through the villages, bringing the good news and curing diseases everywhere. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we heard it in the passage David read when preparing to send out 70 new followers. We heard it in what we just read. Think about the packing list we sometimes prepare. He sent them forth and insisted that they bring nothing. There are many here today, and I will not ask for a show of hands, who are now uncomfortable going to the restroom without your phone, much less going out on a journey with no bread, no purse, nothing. Uh, many of us here have crackers and food uh, on our person right now just in case we get hungry. We need to be prepared. This, uh, this business of Jesus sending people out on a journey with nothing seems completely unrealistic to us. Uh, Justo Gonzalez uh, a liberation theologian. He focuses on, on oppression and equality. Uh, he is from Cuba and, uh, and is a very prolific author and biblical scholar. He says that in this passage, it isn't that the money or the purse or the tunic or the items that, that Jesus names are inherently evil. It is the idea of placing trust in our things, of placing our trust first and foremost in ourselves and the provision that we will provide that is the issue here. Jesus wants to send his followers out without a security blanket so that they are not as tempted to take advantage, so they are not as tempted to claim authority and power on their own. He wants all of the glory to be going to God. He wants people to know that God has provided. Now, this passage is a little different. You see, in in the past, in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the Old Testament, we have the Israelites wandering in the desert and receiving manna, receiving bread from heaven for them. And that was one form of provision. The interesting twist here is that God's provision will come from fellow humans. The disciples are instructed to go to people's homes and to receive hospitality. 
So there are, are three uh, key focal areas I hope that you will come away with and, and focus on here. Uh, one is faith. Jesus, in sending them out with nothing, sending them out with any security blanket, is forcing them to trust and to have faith that provision will come. The second is hospitality, and I'm not talking about just providing a, a bagel at coffee hour or something. Deep biblical hospitality that, that welcomes the stranger into the heart, into the home. Jesus is calling the disciples to faith and to hospitality. And in case you think that he's just warm and fuzzy and joking about this, he tells the disciples that if they are turned away at someone's home, to, to shake the dust off of their sandals. This, this is insulting. Can you imagine this? You go knock on a stranger's home, ask them for something. If they do not take you in, you're shaking the dust off of your sandals in. Jesus was preaching deep biblical hospitality to them because he knows that where faith and where hospitality are present, we get a glimpse of the kingdom of God. Faith, hospitality, kingdom of God. And whether you are new to church or have been around a while, Sometimes when we hear this, this phrase, kingdom of God, some of us don't like uh, that, that metaphor. We don't like this God as king business, and that's fine. But this idea of the kingdom of God that Jesus speaks so much about is more than punching a ticket to heaven. The kingdom of God is not just punching a ticket to heaven saying, yes, I love you, Jesus. I confess your name, and then just waiting for good things to happen. The kingdom of God is something that is already happening. The, the kingdom of God, when we pray the Lord's Prayer later in this service, and we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, what is the next phrase we will say? On earth as it is in heaven. I believe there is, is a state in which we are perfected and beautiful and will be reunited with our loved ones we have lost and all of that beauty, but that is a form of God's kingdom. But Jesus did not come here to just tell people to believe in him and wait, to just be overcome by fear and tell their neighbors to go on and find their own way. Will we be overcome by fear? Will we just punch our ticket to heaven, the kingdom of God, and just wait? Or will we do something? You see, right now, with the news in the world, with the news in our own country, we can feel overwhelmed. We can feel entirely overwhelmed with what is going on in our own lives. In a poll by a real polling company of about 1,000 people, 13% of those polled said they would prefer a giant meteor to hit the earth over Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton to win. 13% <laughs> prefer a giant meteor. There is actually a Twitter account and 20,000 people are on board. You can buy a bumper sticker that says, giant meteor, I will have an impact, all right? Tough on Putin and Iran. This is a, a real bumper sticker that you can buy for giant meteor. Well, this is certainly more sad than funny, but there are people, including many Christian brothers and sisters, who are just waiting for Jesus to ride in on a cloud and see what may happen while evil and darkness are swirling around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we are called to do more than that. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is here among us, and we are part of it. And when we step out in faith, no matter how big or how small, God honors that, and beauty will come. And I'm so thankful to get to see glimpses of it through many of you sitting here today who are active in the world, many who are going through hell on earth times right now, who are allowing people to surround you with love. I thank God for that. This past week, uh, I had the honor of taking a tenderloin walking tour. Uh, it was organized by uh, Calvary friend Stephon Cook, and uh, Stephon runs an organization called Mission Bit. It teaches young people in San Francisco to code, an excellent employable skill where people can make a good living doing that. But uh, beyond just the classroom, uh, Stephon wanted to take the students out to experience reality and learn ways that they can use their skills in addition to making money for themselves. And we met uh, a man named Del Seymour. Uh, Del Seymour uh, is like the mayor of the Tenderloin. As we walked from stop to stop, Del knew everyone. He hugged 
everyone. You see, Dell uh, is not just uh, some savior who's come in to run a nonprofit. Dell spent 17 years on the streets of the Tenderloin. Um, he was a, a homeless veteran. He dealt with addiction. He told the young people we were with uh, that, that he sold drugs and said at one point he was the biggest dope dealer on the street. He was very candid. That he was trying to teach a lesson. He was trying to show what good can come. Dell took us into a beautiful state-of-the-art computer lab at St. Anthony where people were able to access email and were able to learn skills there. Uh, he uh, took us to places that, that, hap that some people don't go to in the Tenderloin, like the Phoenix Hotel where artists like Prince and others have stayed. He wanted the young people to know that good comes from the Tenderloin. He took us by Hyde Street Studios where Sinatra and the Grateful Dead and Tupac and many others have recorded. He wanted them to know that there was life. One of his favorite stops was a very unexpected one. He took us into a bar and restaurant called Piano Fight. Some of you maybe have been there, um, a venue in the city called Piano Fight. In the back of Piano Fight, they allow space for Dell to run a nonprofit called Code Tenderloin. And in that space, he teaches classes to people who are going through addiction, who are going through challenges, and teaches them employable skills, teaches how to interview, gives resume workshops, uh, provides hope in a space where hope is too limited. Dell is out there doing this every single day. One of the, the stops that stuck with me uh, was uh, one in St. Boniface Church. Uh, St. Boniface Church, as many of you know, if, if you have read, opens its doors every single day to our unhoused homeless brothers and sisters in this city. An organization called the Gubbio Project uh, hosts, and there are 300 people in the pews every single day. Dell stressed to the young people that each of those pew sections was someone's bedroom. He said, Walk carefully, you are entering someone's sacred space, you are entering their bedroom. He wanted them to know that this was a sacred space. He said that oftentimes when he takes people into that space, that, that they are overwhelmed, that they have to step outside because it is just too much for them, even though it is a very tranquil space. Dell said that on, on one of the times when he took a group into that space, that a young woman just broke down. She just broke down in tears. She was inconsolable, and he, he asked if she needed to step outside and, and kind of collect herself. And she explained to Dell that in one of those pews, uh, there was something she could not ignore. She saw her mother in one of those pews. She explained to Dell that her mother had been missing and homeless and presumed dead for 10 years. They did not know where she was, and there she was in one of those pews at St. Boniface. Now, I don't know that the story then had a happy ending and they rode off into the sunset, but I do know this. Though that woman is not our mother and is not our technical relative, she is our sister. Our sisters and our brothers are in those pews sleeping right now. Our sisters and our brothers are down on the streets there around the world calling for us in some way. As we were walking out of St. Boniface, Stevan pulled me to the side and said, uh, hey, John, uh, do you think Calvary would ever do something like that? Good question. See, I have said before publicly that I believe that this church, this community, is called to do something significant in Christ's name in this city. I've said that, that years down the road, that we have the dream of opening a Calvary Center closer to the Trans Bay Hub where we can have ministries and have employment training and have worship services, uh, of course, even have yoga and fun things like that. But that is years down the road, and our leadership team is actively working on it. I do not come here with a specific agenda or task for you today other than to join me in praying for what we can do now. What can Calvary do now with the resources we already have? Come to coffee hour with me. Let's, let's look at the pictures that Isabella has taken of our unhoused neighbors, and let's talk and then see how that talk can lead to action. I know many here are already active, and I thank you for that, but I am positive that we can do more. 
See, Jesus sent his disciples out into the wilderness, out into dangerous territory with nothing. He told them to have faith and to be ready for hospitality and that the kingdom of God would appear. The Gubbio Project, uh, for which this, this homeless ministry is named at St. Boniface, is a tribute to a town in Italy where, as legend has it, uh, St. Francis dealt with a very difficult situation. The original St. Francis had to broker a peace deal between the terrified citizens of Gubbio and a hungry wolf that was terrorizing them. A hungry wolf, terrified citizens. Friends, we are surrounded by hungry and terrifying wolves in our community, in our country, in our world. They can drive us to fear. They can drive us to despair. Or we can follow the lead of St. Francis and others after him, others before him, and listen and follow, have faith, open our doors in hospitality, and do what we can for the kingdom of God to appear now. As we prepare to come to this table today, if you are here visiting and are not comfortable taking communion, that is okay. Just observe and take it in metaphorically, but all will be welcome at this table. As you take each morsel, as you take the drop of juice, may God feed you for this journey. May God inspire you. May God inspire us together to bring the kingdom of God to San Francisco here and now. Amen.